Yeah, I would like to welcome you everybody to our morning or afternoon panel or for some even it's already an evening um, or late afternoon panel. Um, we are today discussing about um, electro manipulations and new strategies and threats um, to electro manipulations. I think this panel is topic wise and timely very interesting and we have five um, very relevant papers that deal from different perspectives on the role um, of elections, electoral manipulations, um, and also forms and strategies of electro manipulations, and um, that provide um, a broad range of contributions, both geographically, from um, country case studies, but then also methodological. So I believe that um, after this, uh, the next one and a half hours, we will have gained a lot of new insight into um, what is currently at stake around elections and what are the kind of new tools and instruments that um, are used in particular during processes of autocratization, um, democratic backsliding, but also within the context of democracies. So um, as we have this time challenge, um, we had to do some adjustments to the setting of our panel. Um, so we will start with three paper presentations. That will be um, a paper from on Malawi by Arne Torstensen. That will be our first paper, fo followed by the paper on um, elections in Sub-Saharan Africa by David Olunzano. And then the third paper in the first round will be on mimicking election monitoring by Markus Polak. After those three papers, we have uh, around 20 minutes of discussion time um, where the, our first discussion will provide his inputs and um, then we also have time and questions on the papers and then we go into the second round of papers. I ask the panelists to be a bit short on their presentation um, so that we can manage those requirements on the setting of the panels. So after 10 minutes I will announce um, that you should aim at finishing or finalizing your presentation um, but i'm sure we will have enough time for your like for any points that come up and um, for any questions that might arise so uh, with that i would like to start and um, i would like to ask arne torstensen um, to start with the first presentation pleasure to meet you all <laughs> digitally however um, my paper, or it, I have a co-author also, but he's not here, from Malawi, is uh, the general theme is on the state of democracy and uh, is it backsliding or is it stabilizing? And we use uh, Malawi as a case um, and focusing on the 2019 elections that were held and the aftermath of that election. Uh, was there some kind of manipulation of the system which looked all right and the rules and so on? Um, but that seems to be the trend worldwide also, and not only in Malawi. So are the existing uh, paraphernalia of democracy a sham or just appearance or reality? And uh, you may know uh, Malawi had a dictatorial uh, legacy under Kamuzu Banda until 1994, when there was a, a democratization opening. And uh, there are a number of oversight institutions in place. Uh, the Anti-Corruption Bureau, the Ombudsman, the Human Rights Commission, and the mass media, not to forget them. Uh, there's a vigilant civil society also in Malawi. and Formally, the judiciary has uh, an oversight role. We take uh, a theoretical point in Hirschman's book from uh, way back in 1970, but we think it's useful with his three options of exit, loyalty, and voice. And we focus on the voice because that is what actually happened in Malawi. Um, and the reason for the voice was that Malawi had unrealistic 
ambitions of what could be achieved in terms of development. And everybody was frustrated that uh, it's not coming to fruition. And we refer to both individual protests and collective protests, uh, and both through a legal complaint by two of the losing parties and street protests organized by civil society. And the 2019 general election was, is our analytical case. And we dubbed it the TIPEX election because TIPEX is a correction fluid which was used on a transfer of, uh, of, of tables from uh, counting centers to the central tally center. And this was admitted also by the chair of the Malawi Electoral Commission, although she said that it was not to falsify, but anyway, that was not credible. So um, after quite a while, in February 2020, the Constitutional Court in a very extensive ruling of 408, 18 pages annulled the 2019 elections and ordered a fresh elections to be held within 150 days. But more significantly perhaps, although this was dramatic enough because it had never happened before, but more significantly, the ruling also instituted new rules or a new interpretation of majority. Uh, at that time, a majority had been considered to be the same as plurality, the party gaining the most votes of those cast. But uh, the uh, Constitutional Court redefined uh, majority to mean 50% plus one vote of the votes cast or the valid votes cast. And that was a very significant uh, uh, part of the ruling because it introduced a new dynamic in the political system in Malawi. And the two losing parties, the Malawi Congress Party and the United Transformation Movement formed an alliance because they realized that they couldn't make the 50% plus one vote on their own. And that was what happened. So um, I think I'm doing okay on time actually, <laughs> maybe <laughs> too disciplined, but uh, the fresh elections were held um, in, uh, uh, well, First of all, there was also a very quick uh, legislative move by parliament to change the existing laws to redefine democracy to mean 50% plus one vote. Um, and elections were held, the first ones were held on the 23rd of June, 2020. And the alliance called Tonsa, which means in the chair of the national language means uh, together, one with 58.57% uh, of the valid vote cast. And then a new uh, situation emerged and a new government was formed and so on and so forth. Uh, how well that government has performed since then is a different matter. There's still a lot of voice in Malawi to say that uh, uh, it has not performed so much better than the previous uh, government. Anyway, I'll stop here and uh, I think I've actually kept within my time frame and more so, but I'd like to hear uh, the uh, discussants and others who have questions and uh, uh, observations about our presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Arne Torstensen. You're more than on time, actually, with your presentation. Um, so it gives us more flexibility um, than also for the discussion. That's great. Thank you very much. But before we have the discussion, we have now the second paper presentation that is um, done by David 
Olusanio, who is doing a presentation on do elections enable voters to remove non-performing leaders. So we can't hear you yet. I think your microphone is still muted, David. Yeah, is it good now? Can you hear yes, me? Yes, it's great. It's great. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Yeah, by introduction, my name is David Olusonjo. So I'm a PhD student at Florida International University. And I originally am from Nigeria. And my topic is titled The Election Enable Voters to Remove Non Performing Leaders, Policy and Legitimacy of Election in Sub Saharan Africa. Okay, so there are various questions about the legitimacy of election in Africa. For instance, the post image represents the electoral tribunal. What lacks general election in Nigeria? And also, the, the second picture to the right represents the recent events in, in Senegal. There have been a lot of questions and over the choice and quality of election in Senegal. Also, in, the, in Kenya last election, I mean, there was, after the election, there was question about the quality and legitimacy of, of the electoral results that ended up in the electoral courts. And the, the electoral courts would in favor. Of the incumbents and supported the electoral results. And so in Africa, across Africa, there have been a lot of questions over the legitimacy and quality of election in Africa. So this influenced my choice of topic. Do election enable voters to remove non-performing leaders in sub-Saharan Africa, quality and legitimacy of election? So my research question is again, my research question is do election enable voters? to remove non-performing leaders in Africa. And I, and I, I hypothesize that popular trust in election and the electoral process make voters more confident in their ability to change non-performing leaders in Africa. So I rationalize ability to remove non-performing leaders. So I got my, I got my, like, my data from Afrobarometer on 7, Afrobarometer is an organization, a non-independent, I mean, an independent and non-partisan organization in Africa that conducts survey around Sub-Saharan Africa. So I got, I mean, my first question is, from one of the questions they asked the respondents from the survey, they asked the question, do you approve or disapprove of the way the following people have performed their jobs over the past 12 months or haven't you heard enough about them to say? So I optionalize the various, I mean, response from the respondents. So the question we answered in this manner, approve, unapprove, disapprove, strongly approve. I converted those response from the respondent into a dummy variable, to a binary variable. So I measured those on the approve acts, those like those performing leaders, or those on the disapprove of the performance of the president. I optionalize that as, so I optionalize that as non-performing leaders. So I converted that to a dummy variable. Then leveraging on the, I mean, on the definition of election, I employed Lindbergh turn of four definition of election, which described election as a periodic and the job participatory contested legitimacy institution used to select representatives to the executive or legislative branches of government. Also, I defined policy and legitimacy of election as three important elements. First, freedom of political competition, equality of political participation, and legitimacy of the idea of self government. Okay, so my main argument is that though there have been very perception on, on why elections are externalized in the majority of African countries, some analysts have argued that a change in leadership does not necessarily mean a systemic change for greater democratic consolidation. So moreover, in recent time, there has been concern that Africans' elections have become increasingly contentious and marked by fear. So in some cases, elections have been little more than springboards for leaders who once in office 
they subvert democratic institutions and consolidate their position. So I organized my research in this manner, from introduction to the bibliography. Through my methodology, I employ logistic regression and discrete statistics. Again, I got my data from Apple and 7, which is the latest round of data available, made available to the public. And I probably got some of my data from African Union, from African Union. So the importance of this research, this research had potential to enlighten voters on electoral legitimacy and it's also to provide insights for experts in the field. So like this, this describes statistics of the variables included in the model. So I have many variables included in the model. Also I have many, I mean, key co-variables, I mean, control variables. But these variables represent the highlights or characteristics of a good election in Africa, from freedom of selection to freedom of expression, to media coverage of candidates, and also down to, I mean, to the demographic question of the respondents about gender and education. So these are the like the critical statistics or the variable included in the model. So I mean this histogram represents the demographic expression of confidence in the legitimacy of election across Africa. So from an histogram, Sierra Leone express more confidence in the ability of election to remove non-performing leaders, while from the histogram, Tunisia express or exhibits low confidence in the election to remove non-performing leaders in their region. Also, I call it did a sub-region confidence in the ability of election to remove non-performing leaders across Africa. And from this histogram, it shows that Western, I mean, Western Africa, that's about 16 countries, has expressed more confidence in the ability of election to remove non-performing leaders in Africa. So I ran my regression, I call it some interaction. And for my regression, it shows that like ability of, it shows that these key main variables from freedom of selection to freedom of expression to the question that was asked, the respondent, if they voted in the last election, and some other variables that were, that were texted, some other control variables, so most of my variables were statistically significant. This shows that the respondents have more confidence in the ability of election to remove non-performing leaders in Africa. Also, I fully did this as well, and the, and the substantive interpretation. And so for my findings, my friends provide support for the hypothesis that popular trust in election and electoral process make voters more confident in their ability to change non-performing leaders and hold them accountable. Besides that, among the control variables, other independent variables that equally have a positive impact and as that significant include that media coverage for all candidates. That, and the question of whether the announced result reflects the counted result and satisfaction with democracy. So some of like these variables were statistically significant. Though given the constraint of time, I may not have the ability to, I mean, show this individually. But by conclusion, by conclusion in this paper, I examined the relationship between elections and ability of an ability in removal of unperforming leaders in Africa and argue that popular trust in the election and the electoral process make voters more confident in their ability to change non-performing leaders and hold them accountable. Reiterating this, I then use data from Afrobarometer to show the strong evidence for this relation. And by recommendation, I like given these developments about the question whether elections in Africa are, I mean, like transparent enough to remove non-performing leaders in Africa. As I conclude this say alone, about seven African countries, so, I mean, few of them have held their election from Nigeria, and also about so many other, uh, Nigeria held an election in April 2023. About last month, Syria alone equally had an election, and down the months, I mean, later in the months to 2023, about four other countries will be holding their election in Africa, from Liberia to Zimbabwe, so there have been various questions on legitimacy of election in Africa. So given these developments, so I recommend that investment in the electoral commission and voters education 
a crucial in ensuring legitimacy and quality of election in Africa. Yeah, thank you. So I'll be like glad to make this question and to answer any question at the end of the presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for your presentation. And you had been perfectly on time as well with um, your presentation. Um, so before we go to the discussion, um, we have one more paper that um, will be presented by Markus Polak on mimicking election monitoring. And after that presentation, we will then have sufficient time for all of your questions and comments that you have so far on the first three paper presentations. Uh, hello, uh, very nice to meet you all. Uh, I'm sorry already if the connection interrupts at some point. I'm currently at the Ode mission in Uzbekistan and the uh, Wi-Fi is a bit bad, uh, but going directly into the topic, um, so the topic is strategy, uh, strategies of electoral manipulation, electoral threats, and mostly that's an issue dealt in, dealt in domestic terms, um, but I want to exceed that in a way, uh, go beyond it um, through more indirect threats uh, on the international sphere. So the international election observation is what I looked at, and um, international election observation in general is an important tool to hold governments and election administrators accountable, and but also to give legitimacy to elections, and in a way bridges the gap uh, of information uh, between the international actors and what happens domestically. And what happened in the last uh, mostly 10 years is that a new uh, phenomenon was widely discussed, um, which some have labeled zombie election observation. So the allegation that there is not even to critically um, assess an election, but to, to just uh, confirm uh, a government's election um, always. So basically a pro-government bias. Um, before going more into that uh, about that, um, who actually observes elections? I don't have the time to go for all of them, but what I look into uh, is regional organizations. Of course, they're not the only international actors looking into uh, elections, but regional intergovernmental organizations is what I look, looked into. And more particularly, mostly um, at the OSCE, ODIR, uh, and uh, CIS. And uh, in that context, the uh, IIMDD, which is um, connected to the CIS Interparliamentary Assembly, so the Commonwealth Independent State in the post Soviet, -Soviet sphere. Um, and so the question that I had when starting this is, um, if it's true that um, basically they are not uh, pretty, critically assessing elections, so why the effort? Why putting up an international institution to pretend that you're uh, monitoring elections critically? And uh, that is the case in a way that they are in, to a different degree critically. You see here in a rather old uh, graph here from Kelly. Uh, which shows how differently um, election observation institutions, at least until 2004, were assessing uh, elections in terms of condemning or endorsing. And so the research question, so why are these parallel structures of liberal democratic election monitoring established in the first place and um, how they are perceived by established democracy promotion actors or election observers? So what I argue and what I propose is that um, it's a strategy of liberal mimicry, uh, which is a power political strategy of low intensity aimed at fragmenting and discrediting um, those norms of election observation. So it's basically a method of uh, seemingly accepting the liberal democratic norms. Many of them would argue that they do exactly the same, but then fill it with a new meaning. And uh, I also propose it's the preferred mode of doing it is through regional organization due to reasons of legitimacy. And, um, my expectation is also that um, LIO, so Liberal International Order um, Related Election Observers, so the established ones in a way, um, are constructing a binary between benign, professional, and malign, unprofessional observers. And how did I assess that? I conducted eight semi structured expert interviews. Um, and then, of course, this is a limited research design, a rather limited amount of interviews but it was uh, very hard to access the field, especially concerning uh, parallel observers. And it's a bit of explorative research in a way for future more structural uh, approaches, maybe with um, like bigger end. 
Um, so what are the themes that emerged? Uh, so the first one only very briefly due to time constraints and the OSCE uh, interview is um, we're mostly uh, framing CIS as a relevant non-partner. So it was a relevant actor in the field, but it's not a partner while um, the Western institutions were mostly mutually affirmed their relevance, but also their cooperation with each other. While the CS interview um, was, um, which was a high level CIS um, staffer, uh, was perceiving OSCE as partner in his discourse at least, but at the same time criticizes West Western partiality. But the really central, central question that I um, found uh, very interesting to, to look into is are there actually different models? Um, what is the, this model of parallel election observation? And um, in the case of the CIS, uh, there was a clear um, tendency that national legislation was given more importance than international commitments, which is a bit turned upside down what the OSC is doing, which is uh, putting the international commitments first. Uh, secondly, there was a discourse of pluralism, so in a very attractive argument of having yet more the merrier. It's very democratic in a way to have multiple organizations looking at something. And local ownership, also a very attractive argument uh, in a way that, uh, for example, let's say uh, Russian observers um, through CIS are like, speaking Central Asian uh, language is more likely to understand the culture better, etc. So there was this argument. Uh, there is some difference between the CIS observation and OSC. Uh, and there was an emphasis on the legitimacy of the host government. So um, instead of putting out the aim to criticize elections if they were not okay, uh, you kind of put the emphasis on, okay, actually we do that because we want to legitimize host governments. This was uh, clearly confirmed as well by the other interviews. Um, at the same time, there was repeated reference to OSC methodology. That's also what all my OSC uh, interviewees um, confirm that they really claim to do the same thing, uh, but at the same time reject uh, Western universalism in a way, and uh, and also admit uh, that there is a certain element of response. So uh, during the color revolutions in the 2000s um, and before, OSC um, maybe was a bit the only game in town, and then the response to what happened, which was as interpreted as Western partiality led to this establishment of parallel observation institutions and to expand their missions um, and to be more present in the field. Uh, and also, which was maybe rather particular because he worked for the IPA, but interestingly, he also mentioned that ODR is doing a technocratic exercise that is very limited and focused on a few technical uh, fraud uh, cases, but doesn't really assessed impact on the whole result in, in the end. So like kind of more political assessment, which um, is necessary in election observation according to the interviewee. Um, so quickly here, this uh, result um, on, the, on the interactions in the field. So interesting enough, of course, the OSC and Western observers mostly framed parallel observers as some uh, call them even clowns or fake, unprofessional, politically dependent. Um, while the CIS uh, presented itself as pluralistic actor or the interviewer of the CIS. Um, interaction in the field were described as very limited by, uh, by OSC interviewees. Two meetings take place normally between the two missions uh, when they both observe, but it was framed as fake meeting. While the CIS interviewee really emphasized that there's information sharing uh, and the fruitful cooperation. And media coverage, very essential point as well. Because of course, uh, citizens are also um, uh, like looking into what international monitoring institutions say, and there is a certain communication competition about it. So uh, normally, when the OSC is setting a um, press conference after the election, then the CIS would do it like one or two hours later, uh, earlier, um, and now like waiting for when the time is um, when the OSC is doing it. And also, of course, in some countries, the OSC missions are not even mentioned on. TV or very marginal. And so what does that all say about the uh, liberal international order, which is uh, like the theoretic framework I used, um, but also for election observation as an institution, um, most interpreted as a uh, effort to discredit, frustrate and delegitimize established missions and by plural discourse of pluralism, like the more the merrier, the truth is usually somewhere in between, all of these narratives were reproduced. Um, 
of course, the role of Russia and the geopolitical embeddedness of the of this um, issue was also discussed. And uh, last but not least, which is relating to the topic of this segment, uh, as a tool of authoritarian survival, uh, which is increasingly present um, by, for, for example, there's also a, uh, in Russia, there's, uh, there was this difficulties to access actually as a mission for the OSCE, but the CIS would do it also for, with le less requirements methodologically and less staff present, et cetera. Um, so my conclusion is that gathering evidence in these interviews is that there is an increasing polarization in the field of international election observation and contestation uh, and fragmentation, yeah? And especially looking into what Western observers and Western experts uh, in these institutions were um, describing a discourse of antagonization, discreditation in a way. Um, so the construction of the malign and the benign um, election observation, mostly referring to the declaration of principles as an um, important standard for election observation that is actually of this benign and professional late nature, but also a way of competition uh, in the field, um, especially when it comes to communication. So the question I want to also ask, um, which is more practically to you maybe, what can be the response of established election observation institutions to this challenge? Um, and is it a tool of autocracy with motion? Which is also of course a bit of a um, spicy question um, that is kind of countering democracy promotion efforts such as election observation. Uh, and is the, to bring it even more macro even, uh, is the liberal international order that we know and we thought we not knew, uh, which is able to actually influence what's happening domestically um, in a way, is that crumbling by such strategies? Is it even possible anymore to do election observation effectively? And for the future research as last words, um, of course, data problems need to be overcome. So like there need to be structured data uh, on election observation missions to really be able to um, have more like quality discussion about what is actually the assessments and how they diverge. Um, but also access to the field is challenging because they don't talk to you. That's basically the problem it was very difficult to find anyone uh, talking to you from parallel observer sites. And what's very interesting as an outlook is also that uh, individual observers should be looked into more closely because that's partly individual parliamentarians just going to, for example, Central Asian countries and then talking in the TV about how great the election were without any methodological uh, mission behind it. So that's, that's everything. I'm very looking forward to the discussion and thank you very much for your attention. Or I would like to continue now with the second round. We have two more papers um, to discuss and to uh, be presented. The first paper will be presented by Maria Linden on Trump's manipulation of the 2020 elections. And also here we have some time still at the end to discuss. And if there are some remaining questions, I'm sure we will be able to address them then. So Maria, go ahead. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my presentation. So my name is Maria Linden. I'm a research fellow at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs and also a PhD student at the University of Tampere in Finland. And here is my presentation. I've titled it Trump's Playbook of Electron Manipulation. And what I'm doing in this conference paper is I'm presenting a novel framework for analyzing electoral manipulation in the present day United States. And it's based on a case study that I did of uh, then President Donald Trump's actions in connection with the 2020 presidential elections in the US. And theoretically, the research is founded on Giesman and Klaus's book, How to Rig an Election. And I put a lot of emphasis in this framework on interplay between different electoral manipulation tactics, which I feel is an under-researched, uh, neglected area of study. Here's an overview to start with. I'm going to go over each of these in more detail in just a second. But um, in my case study, I found that Trump tried to use nine different electoral manipulation tactics to um, manipulate the presidential elections in his favor. 
And I've organized these to range from less serious threats to electoral integrity to the more serious ones. So the ones in the beginning lay the foundation. They are groundwork for the use of the more serious manipulation tactics, which are towards the end of the list. And the first one is breaking democratic norms, which is not usually considered an electoral manipulation tool, but um, in this um, function of laying the groundwork, I feel that it's very important. Trump's reluctance to commit to a peaceful transfer of power before the election and his decision not to attend um, Joe Biden's inauguration. Also his decision not to concede to this day, he hasn't conceded the election. Uh, these were important in connection with these other electoral manipulation tools. Disinformation, this is something I'm sure all of you have come across. The big lie, as many Americans nowadays call it, which refers to Trump's unfounded claims of electoral fraud, which he began making around eight months before election day in 2020 and continues to make to, to this day. And the big lie has had a profound impact based on opinion polls on how Republican voters view the 2020 elections and the legitimacy of Joe Biden's presidency. Third, I have gerrymandering. It's uh, a well-documented issue in the United States electoral system, but it's not usually discussed in connection with presidential elections because it has no direct impact. Uh, in presidential elections, each state is one electoral district and therefore the state legislatures cannot gerrymander in the same way that they can in, for example, house elections. But uh, in the 2020 case, several state legislatures were under Republican control because of gerrymandering. And this provided Trump opportunities to use some of the other tactics discussed later. Hacking and leaking. Uh, this was much more famous in the US 2016 presidential elections when Hillary Clinton's campaign emails were hacked and leaked to the public. But the Trump campaign tried to repeat that um, same um, tactic in the 2020 elections when they obtained emails allegedly belonging to Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden, and tried to publicize them for maximum impact on elections. It failed because the media considered it electoral manipulation based on 2016 experiences, but it was nevertheless an attempt in that same realm. Uh, fifth, I have voter suppression, also a well-documented issue in the United States, also very con controversial. Uh, in the United States, the two big political parties do not agree on whether this is a relevant issue or if it's just uh, something that uh, the Democratic Party is trying to use to, to uh, denigrate the Republican Party. But uh, I consider it a legitimate uh, issue of electoral integrity in the United States. And uh, in the case of 2020, litigation that the Trump campaign and other Republican entities engaged in over voting practices before the election were clearly designed to restrict access to the ballot box. And it could be argued, and I do argue in my paper, that they had a clear intent to try and disenfranchise voters who were likely to vote for the Democratic Party. Intra-party pressure is a term I've coined myself. Um, the context of the American electoral system is somewhat specific. This doesn't apply to all elections everywhere around the world, because in the US, um, pretty much everybody who runs the elections is partisan. They are elected or selected to their posts on partisan basis. They rep represent one party. And Trump tried to take advantage of this by pressuring fellow partisans, other Republicans, everybody and anybody from local election officials all the way up to the vice president to commit undemocratic, illegal, or even unconstitutional acts that were all designed to help Trump stay in power, regardless of what the voters decided. Then there's attempted collusion. Trump's first impeachment a uh, long time ago 
in 2019 was because he had been pressuring the Ukrainian president to help him denigrate Joe Biden, who was at the time not yet confirmed to be his political opponent in the 2020 elections, but it was already looking possible or possibly even likely that he would be the one. And then later on in 2020, uh, Trump's personal lawyer collaborated with a Ukrainian politician who was later determined by the Trump uh, administration to be a Russian asset. And this lawyer and the politician were also trying to denigrate Joe Biden. Then there's intimidation and violence. I think that the US House Committee, uh, Select Committee that looked into the events on January 6th, when there was a, an attack on the US Capitol, they did a pretty good job uh, showing that Trump had a role to play in this, in this violence that occurred that day. It all begins with uh, Trump's comment in a TV presidential de debate where he said, proud boys stand back and stand by. This is a military command that he was basically issuing to a, an extremist militia group, which implied that he would later give them marching orders. And it's been researched afterwards that when he later tweeted that his supporters should come to Washington DC on January 6th, when Congress was set to um, confirm, finalize Joe Biden's victory uh, in the elections, that when Trump invited his supporters to DC and said, be there, will be wild, that these militia groups, not just Proud Boys, but others as well, interpreted this as Trump giving them marching orders. And they came and they were armed. Then according to witness testimony given to this January 6th committee, um, Trump had been informed that many people who had come to this rally, that uh, this event that he was organizing on January 6th, that many of them were bearing arms. And there were these machines that were designed, that were put in place to keep arms out of the designated event area. But apparently when Trump heard about this, he got angry because he was worried that the crowd would not look big enough in photos. So he asked to take these machines away so that uh, people could enter while bearing arms so that he could get a bigger crowd. So he knew these people were armed. He regardless gave them a speech during which he said, among other things, that if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. And then when shortly after a violent crowd attacked the US Capitol, the Congress building, Trump didn't do anything for several hours. And when he finally did ask people to leave and be peaceful, he added, we love you, you're very special. Mm -hmm. And here lastly, as the biggest threat to democracy and biggest threat to electoral integrity, I have corrupting government institutions. Um, some examples of Trump's actions include filing baseless lawsuits after the election, pressuring the Justice Department to just say the election was corrupt, despite all the evidence to the contrary, in the hope that this could be used as a justification to overturn the election. Trump's advisors and probably Trump himself also had a false electors scheme where they tried to recruit people to pretend that he had won the election in some states where he had actually lost. And Trump also attempted to politicize the Department of Homeland Security and even the Supreme Court. Now, we all know Trump's at attempt failed. Joe Biden is now president. But what do we make of all this regardless? What I make of all of this is, is that electoral integrity, in my opinion, is very fragile in the United States. And in addition to the old, well-documented threats to electoral integrity, there are now new threats. And I've taken this framework that I presented here today and I've uh, applied it in further research already. I've looked into the 2022 elections. And based on that study, I would say that uh, a, lot of evidence, a lot of evidence points to there being an ongoing threat to electoral integrity as the country prepares for the 2024 elections. Thank you very much.
Yeah, thank you very much, um, Maria, for your great presentation. So last but not least, we have one more presentation to go, and that is on party development and election violence by Patrick Kuhn and others. I don't know if you're speaking already, yes, but I... I'm, I'm trying to <laughs> unmute myself. I've, I've managed to. Welcome. Uh, thank you. I'm going to add temporal heterogeneity to the talk by uh, taking you all back to the 19th century. So this is a project uh, that I've been working on over the last three, four years, creating a massive data set on 19th century um, election violence in England and Wales, together with colleagues in, in history and, and, and political science. Um, there is an ongoing discussion about uh, the causes of election violence. Uh, there's very limited research on the role of political parties, and this paper kind of tries to, to speak to that. Two of the more prominent uh, pieces that, that speak towards this question are, are listed here, talking about how strong parties prohibit violence while weak parties don't seem to do that, and uh, the work by Kitchell and Kelsman kind of showing that it's very context dependent and that actually early party development might actually increase uh, non-programmatic electioneering. So what we're doing in this paper is we're asking the question of how the emergence of political party affects the use of, of violence in elections. And we look at the 19th century and particularly we look at uh, almost 50 years and the whole series of elections and look at the really, really early days of party development when uh, there was no party in the electorate, no party as an organization, but candidates were kind of forming these ad hoc slates to run in elections and what that formation of slates kind of, kind of does. Um, and it speaks towards the electional integrity, election violence literature, but it also speaks to the uh, British political um, development literature. So our contribution is that we look at these kind of slates, these formalized campaign coordinations of co-partisan electorates, that run in multi-member constituency and how that changes their incentive to use violence versus uh, bribery. Um, and uh, according to our argument that I'll present in a second, it tends to in increase election violence. So we find um, some substantial evidence that there is an increase in violence as you get these kind of emergent nascent part development organizations, these ad hoc um, slates. So to give you a little bit of context of British elections uh, in the 19th century, there are 12 elections that we look at. It's in an era where the franchise is being extended from roughly 18% of adult males to 60% of adult males. Uh, the vast majority of constituencies are double member districts at the time. So they have a block voting rule where every elector has two votes um, and they cannot give them the two votes to the same candidate, but they have a range of options. So they can either plump by casting a single vote for just only one candidate and foregoing their second vote. They can split their vote by casting a vote for one candidate from one party and then another candidate from a different party. Or they can cast a so-called double partisan vote where they cast two votes for two candidates of the same party. All of the elections at the time uh, prior to 1872 were, were public, so you had to go to the market square, you had to go to the, sta uh, to the stage, you had to actually declare who you're voting for in front of a crowd, and that would be recorded in what is called the poll book, and that you see there is an excerpt of, of, of like the summary of what those, that, those poll books kind of provided at the end. Uh, at the time, uh, elections were not uh, free and fair and not violent. There was a lot of uh, bribery and treating going on and coercion. Elections at the time were seen as a major uh, event in, in the calendar of these towns. People would come together, they would celebrate. There's lots of free alcohol. There was prize boxing and fighting, uh, etc. There were bands, marching bands playing. It, it was an, it was a, an, an actual kind of uh, event with a specific culture around it. Uh, these different modes of electioneering, of vote buying and treating, etc., became increasingly more expensive as the electorate increased and as uh, voters became more knowledgeable of what they could demand. And so 
uh, it became very, very difficult uh, for, for candidates to finance that. At the end of the 1980s, it cost in today's money about two and a half million pounds to run for a seat in parliament. And it was difficult to kind of find candidates. So slates were actually kind of a response to these increasing costs. So we're going to form a coalition together to kind of share the burden of, of, of running uh, these, these elections. Um, in the period, you also see in the 1860s a rise of, of partisan voting. So people begin to vote more along party lines and split less their votes across different. But parties really as an organization don't play a role in the electorate. They're, they're not like at an, at, they're not a national organization. They're a purely parliamentary organization. Uh, and uh, the elections are mostly candidate uh, oriented. So the two tools we look at, uh, you know, and the trade off between them is vote buying and election violence. Uh, vote buying is a very flexible tool. It allows the candidate to privatize gains. You buy votes for yourself, et cetera. Election violence is more of a blunt tool. Uh, you, know, you can target certain supporters, but you can't really uh, target individual voters for that will vote in a specific way. So there's always the, the risk of spillover gains to co-partisan candidates. And we argue that uh, when you actually then run as a slate, you face a different type of incentive structure and that transitions uh, how you want to use different tools. So first of all, uh, by using violence rather than election violence, it allows you to increase the net benefits. You can share the costs, but you don't get any loss in terms of, of, of benefits. And when you're kind of running jointly and have like a common set of uh, a pool of money to distribute, then you're always worried that money will be spent on getting votes for the other candidate in your slate, but not for yourself. And that risk is much lower when using thugs that act publicly, where you can see and hear what's going on, rather than vote buying and bribery that happens uh, more um, uh, under the cover and you don't know whether votes are bribed equally for both candidates or whether part of the money that you put into the pot is actually used to benefit only uh, the other candidates. So what the, the theory kind of predicts is that we should see an increase in election violence uh, if, if a slate is present in election and as um, two slates battle each other, we should see even more election violence coming. And that election violence should be particularly elite driven in the sense that it's it's organized. So uh, what we do is we collected uh, for the better half of three years, a whole bunch of uh, data from uh, newspaper reports using a machine learning crawler to kind of crawl all the 600 local national newspapers and identify a whole variety of reports that we then uh, hand coded, uh, et cetera, and found around 2,900 unique uh, election violent events. Uh, for this paper, we're going to use two indicators, the pre-election violence events, was there pre-election violence, yes or no, and was there pre-election violence invi involving hired roughs. And the presence of hired roughs is the indicator that we use to kind of distinguish elite-driven uh, election violence from like generic pre-election violence that might have happened because of drunkenness. Well, we use data on slate formation from Cam and Newsom, which is based on um, whether a candidate had a joint uh, notice uh, that they're running as a slate and they had a joint expense rec record. Uh, that comes from a bunch of secondary sources. And we focus here on the 2,356 constituency elections where we have non-missing slate data uh, for all of the candidates. So this is the general temporal pattern. Uh, that you observe, you see the solid line gives you the proportion of constituencies that experience at, that had at least um, uh, that some pre-election violence. You can see that it's around 25% up until the 1960s, and then it kind of goes, shoots up to almost 75% uh, of, of the constituents that experience some election violence. And you can see that the pattern in terms of the presence of trend uh, slates kind of nicely matches that correlation. But um, the question is, of course, is this just a correlation or is there actually something more going on at the individual level? So we did run a bunch of regressions and you can see that generally the presence of a slate seems to increase election violence, uh, most uh, clearly so when there's also roughs present, and that does so by around 7.5 uh, percentage points. 
We then looked at whether there's a difference between one slate or two slates. And again, you can see for different specifications, as long as you look at the places where you also have pre-election violence with roughs rather than just generic pre-election violence, there is an increase. One slate increases uh, the chances of pre-election violence by about 5% and two slates by, by 17%. Now, uh, this could be just an effect of the electoral system. It might not be driven by slates because in a single member district, you cannot have slates by definition. So we looked at whether there is actually the, a difference between the double member districts with no slates and single member districts or whether it's actually really the slates. And this is the results that you get. Um, the, the, the empty round circles are comparing double member districts with no slates versus single member district with no slates. And you can see that there's almost no difference between uh, the two. And then you have, again, the double member districts with one slate versus the single member districts and the uh, double member districts with two slates versus the single member districts where you can see an increase uh, in, in pre-election violence uh, involving um, hired roughs. Now, another alternative explanation might be that at the time you have a rise in the partisanship I think I have two of the electorate. More minutes. Yeah, I'll manage that. Um, so, if that's the case, that people become more partisan, more polarized, then we should expect violence to not just be there in the pre election period, but also in the post election period. So, we looked at whether there is actually uh, more violence uh, with slates in the post-election periods, and we see a, a, a much more muted and much smaller effect, so we don't think it's just a polarization thing. We did a bunch more mechanism checks. We looked at newspaper densities. Um, we looked at whether um, the state emer slate emergence immediately increases violence or whether that's something that is kind of a learned uh, a tactic, uh, etc. I won't go into that. I'll just close here by summarizing that we do find some evidence. It does seem to kind of qualify some of the election violence literature, suggesting that initial party emergence might actually be a problem and that we should kind of facilitate the emergence of parties and make them really strong uh, organizations that have reputational costs. And it does also kind of support the British political development literature that is a bit more skeptical about parties emerging on a programmatic basis, but saying that parties actually emerged as a campaign tool and as first and foremost, as a way for elites to manage uh, the election and save costs in doing so. Thank you very much. Uh, I look forward to comments and the discussion. <laughs> <laughs>